Welcome to Ear Biscuits, the podcast where two lifelong friends talk about life for a long time. I'm Rhett. And I'm Link. This week at the Brown Table of Dim Lighting, we are talking about nerves, man. Hmm. What's the most nervous you've ever been? Hmm. There's been lots of instances. We put ourselves in lots of situations where we've just been toe up with nerves. You know? A little and, bit of loose, loose bowels. <laughs> That's what happens to me. The not, main thing that not happens to always bring that up. But the main thing that that happens is sweaty hands. You get, you get something something comes up, and you know you're nervous when you got to go pee, and then right when you get back from peeing, you got to pee again. You got to go pee again. It's like your body's telling you just like evacuate, just empty everything so that you can be light and you can escape or perform or whatever needs to happen, because you don't want to pee in front of people. You know, no, you know, that's be yourself because it's a sign a, of weakness. Well, it's also a vulnerable moment, you know, because it's hard to just pinch it off. You know, if you're gonna, if you're just gonna, have you ever peed yourself in a in a heroin my, in situation? In my mom's bed, yes. What? Well, yeah. Have you ever peed yourself out of out, just out, out of, of fear? Fear. Well, is that a teaser, or do you want me to answer that right now? That would be a good teaser. If I mean, if, if, if that and more today on the air business. Yeah. No, nah, let's just no, we don't we don't pl- we don't have to play that game because the answer is no. <laughs> it hasn't happened to me. I've never it, peed myself out of but fear. But I don't think it hasn't happened because I'm a composed person. I just think that I haven't been in like it, the classic movie trope is someone points a gun at you. And then you pee yourself, right? Like that situation happens quite a bit in movies. Mm-hmm. And it's always like a sign of weakness of like, oh, he peed himself. But I've never had that happen to me. I've never, I hope it never does. I've never had a gun pointed at me. What's what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm saying I've never had a gun pointed at me. But you're also saying you never peed your pants. Yeah, but I'm saying that that's, that's, an, that's a situation. I've never felt really that much in danger other than maybe like a close call and a wreck or something like that. But that just that feels like a different What about being thing. really drunk? I haven't had that happen either. But that's another way that men pee their pants. Now women pee their pants all the time. <coughs> oh blink, right? Blink. Oh, Isn't that what y'all do? Ladies? All the time. <laughs> yeah, but it, is it not, like Christy tells me that there, uh, there's different, there's been points, in, I mean, first of all, when she's pregnant, and if she starts laughing, she'll, she'll pee. Well, she's like, and let, oh, let me, yeah. let me and be that's, clear. That's excuse. Not just when pregnant, but women who have been pregnant and have given birth are also more likely. Oh, is that what it is? My yeah. goal, yeah. my goal, yeah. usually with my wife, is if, if I'm making her laugh and she doesn't pee a little bit, then I haven't succeeded. You know what I'm saying? That's my goal always with my wife. Make her pee just a little bit. And but not enough to where you can tell, just enough to where you have to ask her and then she'll have to she has yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't see any like thing pooling or anything. It's just so it's, she has to tell me. So it's moms that pee their pants, not women in general. <sighs> Link, I don't know if I want to. It, it has, I, I don't know if I want it, to. Punch it has to do with like the 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 muscles down there and yeah. like uh after uh, it a lot of moms or former like people who've given birth do it because um, the muscles down there have kind of they've they've changed and adjusted and like so okay. it, that's usually why. But you know, um, for those who haven't given birth, it could still happen. I would suggest Kegels. <laughs> yeah, I was just gonna say you, know? you got to work out. If they're <laughs> you gotta, all muscles. You, you gotta, gotta work you gotta work those muscles. It might yeah. have also just be <laughs> physics too. If you think about it, if I've got a faucet. And I turn it on and turn it off. Oh man! But if I've got a faucet that's got a hose attached to it, exactly. And I turn it off and turn it on. I can pinch that hose. You can. We can pinch the hose. Got a you hose. can pinch the hose. Y'all got. Uh-huh. Yeah, y'all don't really have anything. to So pinch. we might be peeing no, ourselves all the time. That's what the kegels are for. Yeah, <laughs> it's an internal. We pinch. might be peeing yeah. ourselves all the time, but we're catching it. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's the difference. Yeah, they yeah. make they make things to help women after pregnancy now, though. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. In France, they give it to you for free. Mm. Which. What what what? Oh, what, is it? what is it's it? like a Brie? no. It's like it's a like a plug. it's like a device that's kind of like a vibrator, but also tightens everything up down there, so you oh. can regain strength. Oh, and, interesting. Yeah, and they give it away in France. Yeah, 
Like you get one in the mail after you give. Like birth? after you give birth, like yeah. I don't know if it's at the hospital or where, but they give them to you. So you here's can help your dildo because they care. Why is it only in front? They're just so healthcare. Yeah. Yeah, they, they're so yeah. healthcare. <laughs> <in France. laughs> the, government, the government is involved. In France that. is so healthcare. <laughs> <laughs> Well, how did we get here? <laughs> uh, getting ner- Well, uh, the reason why I wanted to talk about getting so nervous <laughs> is because I had a nightmare last night. Hold and on, hold on. This is this a nervous night. You had you had a nightmare the other day because we were with somebody and you said something about a nightmare and you were like, I don't really have that many nightmares. Oh, you talked about it on Good Mythical more and it wasn't really a nightmare. It was. The way you described, in fact, you know what? We'll just let it happen on Good Mythical More to not bring it up here again. Right. It wasn't really a nightmare. It was just a weird dream. Well, yeah, it was about you, but it right. wasn't a nightmare. You I described mean, it as a nightmare, though. Uh, did I? Mm hmm. Well, <laughs> maybe off camera you did. Last night, I was, we put the dogs in their, in their bedroom, which is like their little cushy kennel down at the foot of our bed instead of sleeping with us because they've been getting up so much in the night, doing stuff, drinking water. Using the bathroom, insisting on needing things. Mm. So we're like, you're going in your bedroom. We got to retrain you again. It happens to like, you got to sleep through the night. Of course, they never do. They'll like bark and yip at like three o'clock in the morning and get in the bed, which they did last night. Oh, they. Because we're so sleepy, like one of us will get up and just like, okay, come get in the bed. It's just like having a freaking newborn um, that's with a lot more hair. I think that's who, really do, who does most of the crying when you get out? Uh, last night, I don't know who it was because Christy got up, I was still asleep, but then the dogs getting in the bed is what woke me up, Mm -hmm. but I was cold, so I was happy because both the dogs sleep around me and they get me warm. But then I went back to sleep and I had this nightmare and I woke up like drenched in sweat, like just like pouring sweat. And it was... It was a nervous sweat this time, not like a heat sweat. And here's what happened. I was on stage at this like auditorium and it was packed. And this was not like a, there was, this wasn't a written link thing. This wasn't a professional mythical thing. This was like. It was a link thing. It was just a link (laughs) thing. And. Like my my family was in the audience, extended family. Um, I'd say there was probably there might have been a thousand people there. Whoa! And I get up and I go to the podium thing. It's like a music stand type thing. And so is this a speech or is it, it, it like a one man performance? It seemed like it was going to be a speech, but right from the start there was like technical difficulties. Hmm. I think there was some sort of music involved because it, I think it was a combination of everything that I could have done, including like, a, it, there was like a DJ type equipment, but not actual DJ equipment. You were giving a TED talk on DJing. Some, it was kind of like that, yeah. It was like gonna be musical. It was like a keyboard type apparatus. I had notes as if it were a speech. And then... I, I take it all up there, and I can't. I couldn't get the technology to work, mm. and then it wasn't like it was just a microphone. I couldn't even. I can't even tell you what wasn't working. I just knew that like I was. It was a bitter fail from the beginning. Like people couldn't hear me. I couldn't, and then I was trying to like talk loudly and like acknowledge the fact that like this is going to shit in a handbag kind of a thing, and. Uh, I'm struggling up there in front of everybody. And then my notes start going all over the place. And then it, the, the technology starts working, so I try to start my, my speech or whatever. But now my notes are all out of whack, and I'm trying to find what it is I'm supposed to be talking about. And then all of a sudden, Christy's up there with me. Oh. Like she, like my my wife came up there to help me. Got there peeing herself. <laughs> <laughs> I was the one, like she was pretty composed, but then we start having an argument in front of everybody because like I'm embarrassed and my wife is helping me. And like it's not work. And like we're fighting because we can't make anything work. And at, at certain points I go down off the stage to like my loved ones. And my dad was there. I go up to my dad. Check in with him. 
and I'm just like apologizing and embarrassed uh, right. to like, oh, I'm sorry, you, this isn't working. And then like um, somebody else comes up there. Who was it? It was either the Green Brothers, like Hank and John, or it was the Fine Brothers, or some <laughs> like it was some sort of internet brother okay. duo. Okay. And they come up there, and then they start working on it, and then they, they look under the podium. Are they part of the show, or are they just tech support? I, I think maybe they had some part in the show earlier, because they looked under there, and they were like, oh, you, we got, we got, you gotta, all you got to do is flip this switch. Oh, yeah, the switch, yeah. And then there was like this little toggle switch under there, and everything worked. And it was as if they had switched the switch and didn't mm. switch it back. It was the on, the on button, it was like power it, button. <laughs> like it was their fault. But at that point, there was no recovering, and I was just like in front of everybody, like, now what do I do? Just completely exposed. I mean, I might as well have been completely naked and peeing myself. Mm, that would have been worse, probably. But that's what it felt like. And I was, and I woke up drenched in sweat. And think, I mean, thank God I hadn't peed myself again. And this type of dream hasn't happened to you before? It's been a long time. Uh, this is a, this is a, I feel like this is a. It's classic, it's right? It's a type of dream. Especially when it's like, but I'm it's up here and specific. I don't know what it is I'm supposed to be. I don't know what speech I've prepared, but I know I need to give it. That was also part of it. Mm. Kind of like you show up for the last day, of cl you show up for the final exam and you've never been to the class. Which I still have that dream. I just. My dream is forgetting that I was taking a class. I think it's so, your oh, fault. Oh, crap. I forgot I was taking that class. You know, yesterday. Oh, no. You triggered this when you started going through yeah. all the shit that we needed to be doing. Yeah, because we do. That we were behind on. And like you, I was, I, I've been doing good being in this world of ignorance. And then you're like saying, Hey, here's all the stuff that we need to be doing. Well, what doing. if we both lived in that world? What would happen? Hey, I, 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 it was, it was good. It was a good and necessary conversation. Tour would start and we would have nothing prepared. But it planted these seeds where I was just like really stressed in my dream. But it just reminded me in waking hours of, first of all, how I don't like to sleep in a pool of sweat. That's not recommended. But also, all of the fe nervous feelings of like being on being on the spot, like having to perform, having to having to execute something, most usually live. Yeah. And then I was like, well, so it, it brought up all of that, all of the nerves associated with those type of experiences were kind of loaded into this anxiety associated with. Not live performances we have to do now. Like the tour that we're going on, I'm very excited about, and like the structure of it is such that like I don't think I'm going to be nervous going out there because we're like it's going to be very loose and we're we're doing Good Mythical Morning live. So it's it's not an anticipation of that, but it's just kind of like a channeling of all those previous experiences of being anxious about a performance and just superimposed on our to-do list of things that we need to, mostly it's songs. We got to write too many songs in too little well, amount of time. So we're going to end up talking about all the times that we've been most nervous in all the situations. Yeah, that's what I wanted but, to do. But before we get to that, yeah, I've been thinking, I mean, I, yeah, I did trigger it because I'm literally, and Jenna, you know this because we're trying to find this time, right? So mm -hmm. we have... And we and I'm gonna add to it right now, right? So we have a we have a we have don't do it, don't do it. Well, I can think of one song, and I can actually I can think of a few more songs to be prepared for in a different context. But then there's four songs that need to be written, and there's one a, 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 another song that needs to be that has been written, but we need to figure out because we've got to perform it next week and something that we're doing. Oh yeah, and so. And uh, yeah, I started thinking about that, and what, well, I, and I was, I've been thinking about it a lot. Obviously, that's why I've been talking about it mm -hmm. because we've been trying to find the time. And like last night, I was thinking, because one of the things that I've been doing with, with my anxiety is, if it's nighttime and I'm not actually going to work on 
anything, right? If I if it's like okay, I'm not working anymore tonight. I'm not writing anything else. Then my like anxiety. This is kind of a mantra, but it's more of just a mindset. I trust my future self to handle this. Oh, right. I don't know where I got it. Some podcast. And then I'm able to be like, okay, then your present self doesn't have to think about this for the next two hours before you go to sleep or be thinking about it as you're falling asleep. Mm -hmm. Because our future selves will solve these problems. It may require us staying up very late one night or, you know, we may have to do what we used to do. We try to fit everything into like reasonable hours in in, in our middle age, but we may have to Mm -hmm. pull the trigger on like, hey, we're going to stay up until midnight tonight or beyond to like land all these things. I know you hate the idea of that, but some of the best work happens in the Some of the best work happens in the dark. Um, (laughs) But yeah, I have, so I've been thinking that. And then the second thing I've been thinking is, and Jesse tells me this all the time, when I start talking to her about all the things that we have to be prepared for Mm -hmm. and all the things that we are creating, she's like, if you didn't have this, you would be so, like you would be miserable. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, if you actually didn't have these things to be working on, right. to be making, yeah, you would create the things to be. And that's my, that's my history is if I don't have the things, I create things. I create responsibilities for myself, creative responsibilities for myself. So I agree with that, too. It's just, yeah, I, it was the first thing I thought about when I woke up today. I was like. Crunch time, baby. I was like, Here we are. We're, yeah, it's coming down to the wire. But this is when we're at our best. We're like living through a song biscuit right now, right? Where we have to write a song in an hour and then perform it and release it on the internet. We're kind of in the life version of that for like five or six songs. I, it's a good I trust, problem to have. I, I trust uh, our future selves. Yeah, but our future selves keep scheduling other stuff. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no, our present selves are scheduling stuff. Our present stuff. selves keep getting other things put into these spots that we've set aside for creative time. But I trust our future selves to do it. We're going to be fine. It's going to be great. And they're really. And I'm really glad that we're writing this many songs. I don't know how I ended up stumbling upon somebody tweeted, or I, I don't know where I saw it. it. May have been a TikTok, but it was a link to an old one. One of the song biscuits. That's why I was thinking about it. And it was a. It was a song biscuit for. I don't know. We we wrote. A bunch of songs that are not in your mind at all right now. Definitely not in my mind until they are presented. I was like, "Oh yes, that, oh yeah, that's you- a song that we did for that for this thing." Even the 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 end of tour song, "Friends Till the End," like that song. Yeah, I saw somebody talking about that song, and I was like. Forgot about that. I would live the rest of my life without ever thinking about that song again. <laughs> <laughs> and then I listened to it, and I was like, "That's a good song." Not bad. That's a good song. <laughs> so your past, your, your past self surprised you. Well, it just hit me how many songs we've written, and so it gives me confidence that we can write six songs. I'm seeing a lot of chatter about the last CD that we released, the the up to this point CD. So- yeah. It has like tw- the 21 songs that we had written up to that point, give or take, probably released in 2009, maybe 2010. But like people are talking about it being sold on eBay for $500. Mm-mm. Well, that's what they say. And then somebody like posted something where they found one for a dollar ninety nine at like a, like a thrift store or a thrift music store. Like Ben or something? Yeah. That's not surprising. People are looking for these things. That's what I see most of the time. Somebody finds an old something of ours in a place, and it's like $2. But that, 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 that that's thing. That's the, the, the normal thing. Uh, the last album, proper album that we released that we actually. Because there's not many of those out there, that's for sure. Yeah, it's that. that's like the sought-after collector's item. it's a very out. cool. Like, we went all out on the design. It has a poster. Mm-hmm. On the inside, it's got a lot of songs on it. Because people are buying CDs again, you know? It's like, yeah. now that the record thing is happening. And cassettes. People are now buying cassettes. They're buying CDs because it is the highest music fidelity is on a CD. Yeah. 
Though I think if you listen to Tidal, they have the higher uh, yeah, music they, fidelity They have, they have a master, files, master quality. Like the Aflac or whatever it's called. Anyway, I just want to, I want to go back through all the times where we've been all nervous as all get out. Okay. But we'd have a jigsaw puzzle. You know, if, if you need a way to zen out, you can buy our jigsaw puzzle. It's available. At 500 pieces. How long does that take? Um, depends on how smart you are. Mm-hmm. It depends on how much of a puzzler you are. Well, it's a certain type of intelligence, spatial visualization or something like that. I don't know. Yeah, you can get your guillot with the puzzler or whatever it's called. You have to have patience <laughs> and, and that particular skill, and it has to be a rainy day. If those three things line up for you, this is you your You remember product. the puzzle song? P-U-Z-Z-L-E, puzzle. Puzzle, 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 puzzle. No, I don't from remember. The, from the puzzle sketch? The puzzle sketch. Yeah, I don't remember. Uh, mythical.com. Ear Biscuits is supported by Etsy. We're here to tell you that there's no reason to panic the next time you're searching for the perfect gift. Now you can use gift mode on Etsy. Gift mode on Etsy takes the stress out of gifting so you can find the perfect item for anyone and any occasion. It's easy. You just tap and click gift mode on your Etsy app or at Etsy.com. Then answer a few short questions about who you're shopping for and what they like, and gift mode instantly gives you curated gift ideas based on hundreds of personas. I love this idea. Yes. Because it it is stressful. You know, like, what am I gonna get Christy for her birthday? Well, she's a ceramics lover. Mm Mm-hmm. I, and I'm sure Etsy has some amazing stuff there because back when I was looking for a specific Moroccan rug, like I was like, oh, I like this particular type of rug. Etsy was the place where I found exactly what I wanted from a person who was passionately creating it. Yeah, and the stuff that you get, just like the quality and the care that goes into this stuff, it's, it's a lot different than the experience of just finding some yeah. big website and just searching for something. I'm, I might even use the word bespoke almost. You, you might. Almost bespoke. Now it's simple to find gifts made by independent sellers for all the people in your life. So whether you need a housewarming gift for the new homeowner or a birthday present for the pickleballer, Gift Mode's got you covered. Need to find the perfect gift? Don't panic. Try Gift Mode on Etsy now. Ear Biscuits is supported by Indeed. We're driven by the search for better, but when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search, match with Indeed. If you need to hire, you need Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, that helps you find quality candidates fast. Ditch the busy work, use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with your candidates faster. And Indeed doesn't just help you hire faster. 93% of employers agree Indeed delivers the highest quality matches compared to other job sites, according to a recent Indeed survey. With all the new initiatives at Mythical that we're constantly uh, starting, uh-huh. we're always looking for people to help us out. That's we're looking right. for people to help us do very specific things and that have very specific skill sets. And Indeed helps to find a way to match the skill set and the experience with exactly what we need in that particular role. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from our preferences So the more that we use Indeed, the better it gets. Same for you. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And you can get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash ears. Just go to Indeed.com slash ears right now and support our show by saying you heard about Indeed on this podcast. Indeed.com slash ears with an S. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire, you need Indeed. The first time I remember, the first of consistent events that I remember being nervous about were before basketball games in high school. Before sporting events in general, but yes. especially before basketball games because, you know, like I played baseball and it's different. Like there's not really that many people there and there's no like running. Basketball, like there's people sitting there in the stands, mm-hmm. and then there's a moment in which you you all run out 
And you're like, here we are. <laughs> We're going to play basketball. And everybody cheers and like, you have to go and do a cool layup, you know? Oh, yeah. And, and obviously, I had some accolades at the time. So I had a reputation that I was trying to maintain and I wanted to win. So I remember getting nervous before those games. And the way that my nervousness would manifest is in sleepiness. Yeah, I and relate I, to that. And I've told this to a number of people, and there's some people who relate. And it's funny because I remember thinking, if you remember, I don't know which synoptic gospel it's in, but there's this moment when Jesus is about to be taken by the authorities. And he goes in there and all the disciples are asleep. And I, and right. I, I think the traditional, my, I used to think, and the way it was taught to me is that they were just kind of like disengaged or something or didn't get what the importance of what was going on. Yeah. I always interpreted it as they were really nervous and so they were sleepy because that's what <laughs> oh. would happen to me. <laughs> All of them. Jesus was about to rouse them up for a basketball game. No, that's not what it was. Um, so yeah, I would get really sleepy and it would take me literally the game beginning and like a couple of plays before I like, like snapped myself out of it and got energetic. Up. And also, I didn't understand nutrition, and I wasn't doing anything to be prepared. <laughs> I wasn't doing any mental preparation. Like, kids that play sports today, they've got the nutrition, they've got the mental preparation, they've got all mm. the stuff that you can see on Instagram and TikTok. They can be totally prepared. I would just, like, eat some pudding and then <laughs> show up sleepy. <laughs> Take three plays before I was fully awake. I mean, I, I, I got really nervous for every sporting event, not because I was competitive, but because I was so afraid of screwing up. Well, I think that that's why most people get nervous before sporting. That's why I was nervous. I didn't want to screw up. But I, it wasn't about the um, the crowd watching. It was more like well, I don't want to. I don't want to fail the team. I think. Really? Well, yeah. Yeah. I didn't want to fail anybody. Well, and My I never parents. thought about the fact that like basketball, there was a there was a crowd that was very close. And they were yelling at you, and you could hear them. When you were at a soccer game, people aren't even watching. They're not really watching, and they're, they're sparse, and it's in a football stadium, and they're really far away. And there's, yeah, and it's not. You know, when I say that, packed. I say a soccer game at Harnett Central High School. Yeah, in my the soccer game. I don't, obviously, people watch the football, and people really care about it. Mm -hmm. Sorry to offend you. I'm just saying, in our context, no one was watching. They came to these games as like a social event. Would you hear people <laughs> yelling at you when you were free throwing? I wasn't nervous at all once the game got going. I was nervous throughout every single moment of gameplay and, and everything I ever did. And because this is, I was never good enough to enjoy it. But this is a consistent thing throughout all, all of these things is that my nervousness always proceeds the event. And then once the event starts... It goes away completely. So like even in the midst of, oh gosh, we're down by one and I just got fouled. There's two seconds left. I need to make both of these free throws for us to win. I really, really wanted to make the free throws. And I w I'm not saying my heart rate didn't increase, but it wasn't nervousness in the same way that I had before the game. It was more like intensity in the moment. Mm -hmm. But it was more like, yes, I'm supposed to be here. But before the game, I was like, man, I, I don't know if I can do this. I feel like I need to take a nap, a little I nappy. I remember in terms of performances with the two of us, I think back in the Campus Crusade days, whenever we were hosting, emceeing the annual Christmas conference, you, get, you know, when we moved to, it was like, it wasn't just NC State, it was like, all schools from the surrounding states. There was, what, 1,800 people there? 2,000? Yeah. Um, I want to say 3,000, but I don't think it was that many. I doubt it. Um, that's still a lot of people. It felt big. And it, and it was the one time a year that we would do something that big, and we would... There's a lot of build up to it. ...dedicate preparation for at least six months. Usually, it would be on a, in the back of our minds and then move to the front like six months the whole year was in the back of our minds. So then that first night, we made a big deal about, okay, this is, we'll have some fun with 
you coming out or eventually when both of us came out to like host the event, we would have a, a video and then we'd come out. Sometimes we would come out. One year we came out and did a dance routine. Yeah, in yellow suits. It was awesome. That was a weak year. It was a weak year. But we were backstage for probably two hours beforehand, just like sitting back there pacing and just waiting to go out there. Like a whole year's worth of prep and build up to this moment that nobody thought about it the way that we did. No. So it wasn't like the Super Bowl or even like a a, a big game of any sort. It or, was our Super or Bowl. Or even a performance. It wasn't like, I'm going to this thing and I can't, some people might have been like, I can't wait to see what Red and Link are going to do. It's always amusing and it's always fun, but it wasn't the point of the event. It was the point of the event was everything else. Just it, we were the MCs that were just introducing it, but we turned it into this. Well, we went way overboard. Ten minute opening performance, totally self indulgent. Like, but it was fun. It was fun. It was very it was fun for the audience. Well, but there were, you, and, but, and then there were some people who were like, guys, too much. If you didn't know, if you didn't know what it was going to happen, you were like, "I'm going to this Christian conference." Who there's these guys up there in these big yellow suits dancing to uh, P.D. Pablo? (laughs) Yeah. Well, what what is happening? (laughs) Praise Jesus! It's like what is happening? (laughs) How did this happen? I mean, we were what went wrong? We were good at giving them a "what's happening" kind of feel, and you know, most people like a good surprise, a pleasant. Comedic surprise. No, but I was very, we very nervous. It, we built it up so much. We were so, no, I mean, that's when it would be like pee every 10 minutes for the two hours leading up to it. And you'd go into the bathroom and it would just be like this little trickle. Yeah, you, I mean, you just got to, my bowels get much more affected than yours. I, I have surprisingly much more sensitive bowels than you, maybe because I eat so much. But like, that's my go-to is just full evacuation Mo- like on a day on a christmas conference day in in that first thing the first night it was it was a night right so the opening day you would come and you would register and then we would go that night mm-hmm. so that day i had all day to prepare and all day to prepare means taking five dookies <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. i mean i was completely yeah. cleaned out and we did all right we did all right when we went out there it was fine. And but, then, uh, then but the it all comes is, to a head. There though. were like five days, and there was a morning meeting and a night meeting, and we'd usually do give or take something every morning and every night. So then by, by the third day, it was like, well, I'm not nervous every single time I'm going up there to the same. A little bit level. nervous. A little bit nervous, but it was nice to then have these other days to like get in a comfort zone. But here's all, also, you didn't have to do anything serious. Yeah. I had to do the serious stuff. You had to introduce I had to introduce speakers. the speakers. I had to transition to worship. I don't even really want to talk about this. I'm not going to give the details because it's too much of a downer. But I had to deliver the most sobering news that I've ever delivered and ever heard of about something that happened to someone's family, if you recall that, that year. Uh, I don't remember what happened. I do remember it being. And it was, there was just something that happened to somebody's family who was there, and it was just like the worst possible thing that you can imagine. And I like, the guy that had been in the yellow suit dancing to Petey Pablo has to deliver. The, you know, I, did, I, I had to deliver, the, I was nervous as hell before having to talk about that stuff. They didn't have to get you to do that. Yeah, they did, I was the MC. Yeah, but, but an adult could have done it. I was an adult. Not really though. I mean, but I had to do the serious. Thing, stuff. I don't think he called himself an adult. And then, like, <laughs> when, like, when the speaker, when the, when the pastor was done, or whoever had been doing some really emotional thing, I had to right. get up there and be like, say something serious. You had to like take notes on the talk, and then like, like reiterate a point or two that made it seem like you had it. You had, you just got up there when we had fun. I had to do all the hard things, man. Hey, I did have to sing at a funeral. That was hard. Well, I did that with you once. You had to do another one? You didn't sing with me at a funeral. It was a wedding. I sang with you at Ben's funeral. Oh, well, yeah. That's different. I mean, like, 
Well, yeah, we did that. That was a graveside thing. I'm talking to like hundreds of people in a church. I'm on stage. I had to do that. What well, after that phase? Because I was nervous. We did. We did. We emceed Christmas conference for ten, ten years, I think. And well after we were off staff, and even well into like secretly doubting the entire enterprise, <laughs> um, still emceeing, but the uh, the next sort of series of events because once we transitioned to making videos, the nervousness is goes away. There is no moment of performance. There's no, right. the curtain opens. It's just, you're just making this thing and then you're just sitting there waiting for comments and likes and there's no nervousness involved, right? There's, I mean, you're a little bit maybe anxious about the response that you're gonna get, but it's a totally, your, your heart rate never increases. So the next thing I remember, and I'm sure there's some events that we did, like we emceed some weird stuff, like we emceed that uh, ad agency thing, the very first ever like uh, digital digital upfronts. upfronts in New York, uh, and then we like emceed the the creative. I thought it was the Creative Arts Emmys way back in the day. It, when we went last year or this year, it was much bigger than it was when we did it. Uh, it, was, it may have been like a technical thing. I don't know what it was, but little weird events like that that I would get nervous before. Uh, but the most nervous, like the, where I feel like I can't be any more nervous and I'm about to explode, is right before we come out on a late night appearance. Not now, but back in the day, and specifically yes. the, the, the Conan. Oh, Conan, Con yeah. Because Conan was before Lopez, wasn't he? Yes. Because Conan was 2011. I don't, I don't remember beforehand. I remember talking to Conan during the commercial break and he was really nice and we were talking about local commercials that we were making because that's what we were talking about. But I don't remember beforehand. Like for the Tonight Show, first time we were on the Tonight Show, that's really nerve wracking because you're in this iconic building, 30 yeah. Rock, you're like walking around and you're seeing famous people, other guests. You're meeting Jimmy in person for the first time backstage. That I think that was the time. I think it was the second time that we brought all of our kids, not the first time, because I think we knew we'd be too nervous to have people there with us, like Christy and Jesse or the kids or something. We knew that. Like it was better to be nervous, just me and you and our people, instead of like having like guests that we needed to entertain. But they file you from your, you know, people keep coming to your dressing room. There's like the producer and he talks or she talks you through stuff. And then the mic, the sound guy comes in and puts a mic on you. And then you have to go into makeup and hair. And they were always complimentary. Oh, it's like, you know, we don't need to do anything to your hair. I'm like, oh, that makes it. I, the, the makeup chair is always the place where I'd let off some steam, like just... Just In what way? Hit, hitting it off with the, uh, with the makeup and hair people. Huh. And they were always so nice. So that would be a little respite. And then I would leave there and come back out, and, and like we would just be waiting for the, for the director with the microphone thing. The, the long-haired guy. The headset. Who's been there since the very first time we ever went. Yeah, He's just like, to come in. All right, fellas, he takes you down this hallway. You go into this very dark space, and, and this, then you this think, is behind the curtain, right? So if you yeah. look on the Tonight Show, there's the curtain. And so, you think you need to pee right then. It's like, oh, sh I, oh, man, do I need to pee right now? And behind the curtain, this is what they have. They have a, uh, a mirror with very low lighting so as not to like uh, spill out. Makeup lighting. But it's basically like your last looks, last chance to look at yourself. And the makeup, sometimes there'll be somebody there like looking at you and making sure that you're okay. Mm-hmm. And then it's very small. It's smaller than this room for sure. And then he like sits you right there, and there's the curtain, and then the and then the roots start playing. You mean stand you right there? Like yeah, yeah, yeah. You're standing. You're standing. The, the curtain. You're 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 like noses against the curtain, basically. Yeah. And when they're back from commercial and the roots start playing, even even this. I mean, I, we've done it how many times? Ten. Ten. Even the every time that happens, I get my heart rate really starts increasing right at that moment because it's just like the curtain's about to open. But the first time, whoo, 
That was, I mean, that's quite a buildup because you're standing back there. If it's a minute, it feels like five minutes. If it's two, it feels like 10, you know? So it's. The nervousness like, gets so intense sometimes. Who's, who's going out first? Are you going out first? Am I going? Okay, you're going out first. You stand in front of the curtain, and then like your nose is against the curtain, and my nose is against your back. It's a very familiar the, feeling. The now. nervousness gets as not now, but then as intense as I can imagine nervousness being to the point where. If I was capable of fainting from nervousness, I would. Like that's how. Like d -d 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 -d, your heart's going, d -d 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 -d. and it's and you're and, oh yeah, and you, I'm like talking myself out of it. Like, but you can feel it's, why am I, why do I care this much? I know what it feels like for your heart to jump out of your chest. Like that's you know you can look. I'm down. getting nervous thinking about it right now. You can look down and you can see your heart beating through your shirt, and your my hands are are shaking. I'm like, and then you start thinking like. Well, how am I going to hold my hands so that people can't see that they're shaking so much? I can't gesture because hey, I'm going I'm I'm to look like I'm doing some sort of a jazz hands. <laughs> a jazz hands, you know? I'm going to sit on my hands when I go out there. How, oh, crap. I haven't thought about how I'm going to sit. Am I going to spread leg it? As soon as the curtain opens, the nervousness whoosh, vanishes. It's just weird. And it's like we sit down on the couch, and I'm like, okay. This is weird. No, no, no I, that, the nervousness did not go away the first time because then you're like, oh, this is how close I am to Jimmy. This is him talking to well, me. I'm not, that's what a, is he saying? That's a I'm different sensation. Listening. That's a different sensation. There's right over there. That's not nervousness. That's like deer in headlights, which <laughs> I definitely, if I watch some of those early appearances, I'm like, I wasn't, com I wasn't comfortable. I wasn't nervous. I wasn't comfortable because I hadn't figured out exactly how to hold you. What I'm supposed to, who I'm supposed to be in that situation. And that's a sounds weird to say, but like we had some like little bits that we had figured out, you right. know. And I remember, you know, and my sort of demeanor has changed over the years. Like I was much more like didn't smile a lot and was kind of looked like I was pissed a lot, like in our early stuff. <laughs> and you know my personality has changed a little bit but also comedy has changed comedy has softened in some ways right and i've kind of softened with it and so like if you watch those early appearances i'm not gonna i don't even smile the whole time so you yeah. get you get this impression that boy he's really uncomfortable and i was i was uncomfortable but i wasn't nervous i was just trying to figure out how is this going? How is this thing that we're doing? We're trying to be funny. We're telling this story. Yeah, there's like, there's the stakes of, I'm here to make a good impression and to draw people into our world, you know? And there's an audience and it's live and you can't take it again. And um, there's a lot of pressure there, but there's also stimuli coming from everywhere. You don't know what to focus on the first time you're doing something and when it's high pressure and there's so many other things, it can be it can be overload, which can turn into the deer in headlights thing, or maybe the pee in your pants type thing. You can become catatonic or faint. And once you go on a few times, they're like, "Oh, I know what it feels like to sit here. I know and 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 talk to the host. I know what it feels like to look over there and see all the cameras moving around and." Oh, there's a guy with cue cards, and there's somebody with a, with a, there's a screen. I can see myself on the screen, and all the audience is out there, and I can connect with the audience members. You know, all of these things are, your brain is processing, and you learn how to focus and how to tune certain things out. But you really, you can only prepare so much. You have to go through it. So it took like four or five times before I really felt like, I've done this. I know what it's like, and I know where I'm going to put my energy, mm -hmm. you know? And that brings the nerves down once I'm through the curtain. But, yeah, that, like, build up behind the curtain is, uh, it's, it's, now it's, now it's a thrill to have that type of nervousness because, yeah. I, because I have confidence, you know? And we don't get a lot of opportunities you, for, for that. When you have to, I mean, I was really nervous when, you know, you're exposed giving a speech, like the graduation, the commencement addresses, 
Like, I was really nervous about that because for all the reasons I just gave and I was alone. Like, a lot of this we have each other. That's like, if you stumble over your words or you go catatonic for a second, the other guy knows and can pick up what you're throwing down. Right. Or what you're, what you're dropping. Yeah, it's a different vibe. But there's other types of, there's what, places where we get nervous that. Well, to me, it's the, okay, I'll use this as a way to transition into another, t another setting because one of the things that happens with anything like The Tonight Show, especially in the early days, is the moment that it's, that it's on the calendar, mm -hmm. it registers, it locks itself into your brain, right. and it becomes a source of anxiety, right? And it's, fair, it, it's a little bit, it's subtle. Then the week arrives. The week that you're going to leave, you're going to fly to New York, and you're going to do the thing. And then it becomes this thing that it's one of the first five things that you think about when you wake up that mm -hmm. week, right? And it begins to build. That's how it happens with me, at least. And the other thing that, that I've noticed that this happens with is before a difficult meeting. Yes. Right? So not only have we had this the opportunity to be creators for a long time, but with... If that has, we've had to, we've run this company for a really long time, right? And so for all kinds of different various reasons, there's sometimes you, there, there's different reasons that you have to have a difficult meeting. Yeah, I, I would say there's pitch meetings, which are kind of a performance. And if you really want to sell something to somebody, which at certain points, we yeah. really wanted to sell something to somebody, and you go into the room with like network executives, that's nerve wracking. But to go into a meeting where you have to reprimand, give, give tough feedback, or even let somebody go, whoo, that's bad. That's the, that is tough. Yeah, when we have that's to, tough. like, do the boss thing, when we have to be bosses. Yeah. And, 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 you, and you're the like, oh, we just want to be cool guys. We just want to be your friend, you know? And we are, hopefully, your friend. Um, but yeah, there's sometimes you have to have diff you have to have difficult meetings, and I'm a people pleaser, and I'm conflict avoidant. So, mm -hmm. and I'm not saying you like conflict, but you you have a, you have a different relationship with it than I do. But well, tell me yours, I'll tell you mine. And, and so, this for me is like the way that I try to calm myself is to be prepared. Right? Yeah. I want to know what I'm going to communicate. I want to anticipate a series, like a decision tree of potential responses. Like a flow chart. That then I will respond in the following way. Because I'm not, like, I'm much, I'm a, I may be prepared. I don't like to be like, I'll just figure it out in the, in the moment. Like, that's just not how my personality works. My personality is like, if I say this, they could respond in these three ways, and then I need to have these three responses prepared for these three different things. And that's a lot to keep up with, and I'm not very good at keeping up with it, but that's my, that's how I calm myself, is I'm like, okay, you know what you're saying, you know how this is starting, you're saying this, and then Link is saying this, and it's gonna be okay. Yeah, and it doesn't necessarily work. I'm just saying that's that's how I try to prepare myself. For for me, I mean, it is important to know, like, how to kick it off. Like, you got to have a strong starting point, and then you got to know what your objective is, like your landing. This is something that um, you learned back in the old MC days. It's like you got to you focus on the takeoff and the landing, and then everything in the middle. You just kind of like just do your thing. But you you got to know how you're wrapping it up and how to start it, and so I I approach it that way. So it's less of a decision tree because I can't keep all that straight in my mind. The other thing I think about is what I don't want to say, like the don't the no say these things list. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And if I have to deliver a tough tough feedback or uh, a tough decision. It's like, okay, don't, like, if somebody, if, if it makes somebody upset, 
like you have to you have to you have to stay strong in this way you can't just start you, you can't be bowled over or like change the whole decision because things got emotional you know so i try to be prepared in that way but uh, all of the thinking about all those scenarios makes me more nervous you know and we've had meetings where i we haven't had a lot but i mean we've had a meeting where we've been yelled at <laughs> <laughs> that we were the ones, I mean, we were in the, we were delivering the message, but the way that it was received was not, it was not received well. Mm. So there's, I mean, we've been yelled at, we've been, I mean, there's been colorful language thrown at us. There's been, I mean, it hasn't, that's very rare. It's very rare. But, but it I has mean, happened. honestly, there's a lot. Of t it's very common for there to be emotions and tears, like for there to be crying. Oh, yeah. It's just, uh, it's, oh, man. And so once you experience that, you're afraid that that might happen. And then when it starts to happen, and I'm not saying in any one meeting, but the fact that now you know that it is very much on the table that this can happen. Oh, my gosh. They're like, who wants to sign up to make people cry? Yeah. I, I, like, it's, it's hard. I hate it. It's the worst it's the worst part of being a boss. And it's common. A difficult conversations, or if you're gonna actually be, if you're actually going to be engaged, yeah. Right. It's a very typical part of it. Because you actually are not doing, like we wanna be, like we're these good Southern boys, and we, and I, and then you, you, we're both people pleasers in some ways. Like we're, we don't like to cause, you like to stir shit up socially, but mostly for entertainment purposes, not like to be mean. And so- Yeah, I do not revel in <laughs> um, tough conversation. Uh, but like when you don't, like you really don't want to have difficult conversations. You wish every, everything was just perfect and everybody was just doing exactly what they needed to do and it was a big happy family. But you actually are doing a disservice to people when you don't give feedback or you don't make strong decisions about things. But- right. Right. Everyone has their POV, right? Like we are obviously coming from the POV of the people who run an organization, but every ind individual lives in their world from their perspective and their point of view is valid. And But it may be contradictory. We may not be, see eye to eye. And when right. those things happen, you're just like, ah, oh, man, this really sucks. Like, and there's so much nerves. I mean, it's like the moment you're calling the meeting, you know, it's like for you, for us, it's this, oh, we gotta, we gotta do this. And then for them, if it's a tough meeting, it's like, oh shit, what's this meeting actually about? What's, you know, you try to give them an idea, but then it's like, I, that's, it's, it's, in some ways it's more nerve wracking to be on the receiving end of it, of course, because like, what's coming? You don't well, of know. Of course, it's yeah. You know? Of course, it's unknown. Yeah, so that's, I'm not saying that's horrible. I'm not saying we've got it more difficult no. than the person receiving the bad news. But it I'm may. Just, but it it does make us very, very nervous. And well, then when everybody's nervous, that's just. And then there's this dynamic. Awkward. There's a dynamic. It's. I was funny because I was talking to um, a a band recently. These two people that were in a band, and they were fans, and. They, they like they were fans who had like watched the show a lot, and I don't know how this particular subject came up, but I did, they were asking about like how do you you've been doing this for so long? How do you do this show and all the other stuff that you do, where your the goal is to entertain and to make people laugh? When I know that you must like your your emotional life isn't just always great, right? And so I was like, well, I appreciate that question. Link and I have become master compartmentalizers, right? So, it, right. and I think that this is a perfect example of like, let's just say it's a day where we're shooting multiple episodes of Good Mythical Morning, but yet right in the middle of that schedule, there is what we'll just call a difficult meeting, <laughs> right? So I can't be thinking about that when I'm trying to make you laugh or make the crew laugh and make the people watch right. laugh. And then, Let's say it goes goes real bad. Let's say it goes south and it's emotional or whatever. Still, when Jenna walks into the room and says, "We're back at two o'clock or whatever it is," I can't be like, "Hey, give me a second. We are magically funny. 
Well, it ain't that easy. It's like, no, turn like turn that off, turn the other version of yourself on and go and do and do the show and have a great time. And actually it ends up being a little bit of a reprieve from that because you yeah. know, there there are like people who would be like, guys, we want you to why can't you just be yourself and like don't put your well, you wouldn't have the what you have. You like you wouldn't have all the content that you have if we weren't able to do that. Mm-hmm. And and listen, I totally respect most people that I know that I've known as creators. Uh, they haven't they're having a bad day. They don't make content. They're having a difficult day. They don't make content, and and that's fine. And I respect that. We just build a system where we don't have we don't we're, we don't allow ourselves to do that. Yeah, and we don't plan on changing it because we've actually gotten pretty good at like psyching ourselves out but it's just you know a little insight into the day of these dudes that you watch eating testicles and eating blue foods and commenting on really ridiculous things that are then like having to do adult things in between (laughs) it's not just i mean there's tough meetings with like business partners it's not just employees oh yeah yeah. It's it's any i mean we you know we've had some really difficult like had to be face to face with business partners that you're like hashing out third a, third parties a contract disagreement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And thankfully, we've got a really great team that handles so much of this stuff. Like if you look at mythical and you think about di- if you t- if you write all difficult conversations and difficult meetings and you throw them into a hat, right? The number that we actually have to be personally involved in is a very small minority at this point because we have an incredible team that handles so many things. It's also why we're able to do all the stuff that we're able to do. But it's just a, the nature of the beast that still that number of difficult things it still finds its way into our schedule on a regular basis. I mean, there were points, it doesn't really happen anymore, but like when we started having having our company-wide meetings where you and I would just kind of have the whole company in a room and we would like talk about things like at the at fir- when we first started doing that that made me really nervous cuz it's like this weird sized group of people that are all looking at you to tell them something that is very pertinent to their work life you know it's like this is a different type of pressure and expectation that was like well i actually got really worked up the first few times yeah i you know, I that size group is my kryptonite in a lot of ways. Like I right when you're talking like if it's a small room, like if, if there's thirty people in the room, or less, or less, like a like, like twenty, like 20. fifteen. Oh, that's a tough room for me because I get yeah. When it gets to be now, where it's like if there's if the room is packed. I'm used to it now. It's different, but I don't. I think it, of it to a me. It go, it, it, like my level of preparation is how I is how I combat it. Again, it's just like if I'm like, oh, I know what I'm going to say, then I'm not nervous at all. But if it's one of those things that I've talked about this before with you know the classic, let's go around and say what we're thankful for. I mean, mm-hmm. not necessarily like with my family, but like I've been to a couple of places. Like I did a Thanksgiving one time with some friends and then a bunch of people I didn't know. And there was like that moment. And I'm like, ah, oh, okay. Um, well, I want it to be heartfelt, but I want it to be a little funny. You know, you start thinking about it and then you're thinking about what you're going to say. You're not listening to what everyone else is saying. I just really do not like that environment. Yeah. I mean, it reminds me of, like break, like breaking up with my girl, uh, talking to girls, <laughs> just talking to talking girls to general. girls as a as like a middle schooler and high schooler. Like, I'm telling Lando now, you know, he's he's in eighth grade. I'm like, dude, when I was your age, I was like, the only reason I dated girls was because uh, I felt like I ought to, <laughs> and it wasn't that I. I wasn't even that interested. Like I was kind of a late bloomer in terms of interest, so I did it out of social obligation just to fit in. And that is a recipe for like anxiety. I got so nervous when I tried to conduct myself in relationships with girls, you know? I have to call, I'm supposed to call her on the phone? 
Oh God. Oh God. I wish I could have bled off some of my uh, yeah. my desire and given it to you. It would have simplified my middle school experience. But I was still very nervous. Well, I, you know, what my nervousness manifested in is that moment when you think you want to kiss somebody. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I remember... Well, think about that moment, but it's not you wanting to kiss somebody. It's everybody else wanting you to kiss her. And they're watching at yeah, the seventh grade party at the Lillington I wasn't thinking about everybody community else. building. I w everyone else the was lights completely aren't even blacked out. And Michael is sitting there timing you. So anyway, go ahead. In sixth grade, there was a, the dance, and this is when I had started going with, is what we called it, going with Leslie. Yep. And I had never kissed anybody. And I hadn't practiced on my bedpost like you'd had. Mm -hmm. Should have done it. I'd done it a lot in dreams. I'd done quite a lot in dreams for many years. <laughs> um, I felt somewhat prepared. But we were sitting there at the dance, and next to us was my future girlfriend and her boyfriend at the time. And I had my arm around her my girlfriend and I had, and we were holding hands like cross hatch, hand holding and like this. And it's kind of a dumb way to interact with somebody if you think about it. But like it's you're- very secure, like you could have been on a rope. She couldn't get up, I'll tell you that much. But uh, I don't think she wanted to. You're like a human paperweight. And I'm just sitting there and I'm, we're kind of in the dark a little bit and I definitely think that like I could kiss her, like I can kiss her, I should kiss her. I'm gonna kiss her, and then in my mind it would be like, uh, like my my body wanted to, but then my mind just kept saying no and wouldn't let me do it. <laughs> and right during the moment where I really thought that I was working up the gumption, like my dad shows up at the dance, <laughs> pick, pick me up. You turn your head quickly to make out and it's your dad's face. And that was my only opportunity, because ah! she, she dumped me when school ended, which was like a week later. Did you ever, I mean, breaking up with girls was very nerve wracking too. I. Well, that's because you had to do the breaking up. I actually didn't. I got dumped a lot because I was too nervous to conduct the relationship. Actually, let me see. I got dumped. For, first time I got dumped, I did the dumping the second time. I did the dumping the third time. I did the dumping the fourth. Okay, I did end up doing some dumping. I didn't do the dumping. Um. Yeah, I don't remember. I can't. I, I can't I honestly letters. remember. But I'm sure you got letters. Yeah. Yeah. You got letters. We well, remember when Jana dumped me. It was the letter that I kept in my soccer bag for all those years, and I found it when we moved out here. I still had it. I don't have it anymore. But I read it on some show that we did. She yeah. saw me as more of a friend. You know what that means. I was afraid to kiss her. Yeah. I mean, still to this day. Mm -hmm. Still to this day, you really screwed that up. I mean, I was giving you as good. I was giving you. You did not give me any advice. I gave you as all you, the. You modeled. You modeled. No, and I the gave horn me, dog way. I but, gave I mean, you a lot of encouragement. <laughs> the horn dog way by middle school Rettman Clark. I, I just, I was just like, dude, she's inviting you. She's actually need to ride the four wheeler. <laughs> yes. She's asking you to ride the four-wheeler. Yeah. I know, dude. I just couldn't do it. Um, I yeah, I'm sure I, I got to. I'm sure I got nervous before those difficult conversations, but I think if you're not get, if if you're not signing yourself up for something that makes you nervous, maybe you should. That's the thing that we maybe started to discuss. Was that like, you know, when we were going on Fallon or going, like doing something, like, it's like, you know, we just have this knack of continuing to put ourselves in a position, this is what we would say to each other, where we feel this way. You gotta throw yourself in the deep end a little bit. And. Discomfort causes growth. It, and we have grown as a result of it. You don't have to like, it's, it's not just about commanding a room or an audience, but it's about being able to hold yourself with poise in an environment of stress, because it's gonna happen. And if you can find, 
if you can put yourself in a fun situation that you're like, man, I, I'm so mad at myself that I'm doing this, but when it's over, I'm glad that I did it. It's a reward, and it oh, kind of pushes it, you on. And it's the thing that memories are made of. It's the thing that memories are but made of. But it's the of. thing your life is made of. You know, Shepard uh, plays some music, and he's he's been in a couple of bands. And uh, why did you use that voice when you said that? he's been is, in a couple? Of this bands. is this is a voice I use when I talk about him. <laughs> so okay. he won't. So he won't find out. If he just hears the audio. No, I'm just kidding. Um, and. It took them a while to play their first show. Mm-hmm. And I would always ask, I would be like, so when you, you know, you guys are practicing, when are you, have you got a, have you got a show? And he would be like, no, no. And I would, mm-hmm. and I was just, I was like, hey man, just set a date for a show. Set a date. Just set a date. Yeah. Because you will get ready for it. Like that's when it will come together. Like when you put yourself you in a go. situation where you have to show up, you've got to be able to do, you got to be able to do this. And then uh, they had, you know, they they had their first show, and it was like uh, he's never gonna forget it. He's never gonna forget that. And he and he got like this experience, being like, oh yeah, like not only is it intensely rewarding to right. do something like that, but it really is the only. It's the only way to get the in my in the way my mind works. It's the only way to get properly motivated to do something is to not make it into a performance necessarily, but just to like create an environment where there might be some nervousness. Right, we want, we always sign ourselves up for things like to to be in front of an audience and we would always sign ourselves up out of excitement and then it would dawn on us, oh God, I'm gonna be, I'm nervous about this. You know, it was, we were driven. And then we, you know, you just kept, and so no matter where we are in our career, we're still driven to say yes to opportunities that then we find ourselves like, ah, I didn't I didn't think about how nervous I was going to be. If I did, I might talk myself out of it, you know? Yeah. But like tapping into that excitement and saying yes, then it has kind of built uh, the ability to do things that we're still getting nervous, but they're just, they're different and bigger and or stranger opportunities, whether it's, you know, Laying somebody off, uh, renegotiating a contract, or you know, perf- performing to people who don't know you, or do know you, or whatever. Yeah, I think it's was about, this motivation. I think it's. For, was, are, is everybody listening? I to mean, sweating? I think I think if there if there if there is some sort of lesson in it, I do think it's that. Um, and this is implied to everybody, I'm sure, but if you're like us, then. Introducing some stakes, you know, can be, I don't know. I just think it makes life more interesting. If you're constantly avoiding situations where there's stakes because it's uncomfortable, um, I don't know. Like, I think you're going to miss out on a lot of opportunities and a lot of growth. Yeah. There's got to be. Say yes to that PowerPoint presentation. There's got to be some uncomfortable situations and I just think it's it's what life's made out of you know a a series of uncomfortable situations Mm -hmm. speaking of an uncomfortable situation yes my wreck uh, I don't know why I started listening to this book uh, The Year of Magical Thinking by Joan Didion who Joan Didion is like a famous author that I had never read who was married to another famous author who I had never read but she's also known for this memoir specifically about um, the death of her husband. So it's kind of, it's a little bit of a downer in some ways um, in that it's, you know, it's a memoir, it's a grief memoir. But her like, her insights into things and the way she thinks about things is fascinating. She's a great writer and it's it's like a four and a half hour listen. So you could- It's about her husband dying. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, so it's a you know classic grief memoir. Yeah, it, I did not know that was a genre. Well, you know, like a you know. How did you sign up for this? Uh, oh, it was. Uh, so I've noticed this. That did you just notice like out of nowhere there were also all of a sudden audiobooks on Spotify? Yeah. That are like included with your your membership. Yeah. And it popped up and I was like, oh, I've heard about this. Oh, it's short. I need something to listen to. And I just started listening to it. And, I, and then I, and, I, and since then I've kind of like 
looked into her her life. She was a really interesting hmm. person that was almost like a style icon in a lot of ways because of uh, just like the time that she came up. Joan Didion? Yeah. Um, so anyway, I recommend it. What's it called? The Year of Magical Thinking. The Year of Magical Thinking. Huh. All right. Hashtag Ear Biscuits. Let us know. Call us and leave a voicemail. one 888 one Next week, we're back. Hey, Rhett and Link. Just wanted to say I'm a huge fan, and I hope y'all never stop making these podcasts. They keep me entertained while I'm at work, while I'm at school, while I'm just chilling, while I'm sleeping, anything. Love you guys.